Come on, what's up? Praise you. Woo. We are back. Come on, look around. This is high school only. We are back right now. How many of you were here the last time we did a service like this? We're talking like pre-COVID. We're talking like, uh, what was that? been like February of 2020, right? And uh, man, what a journey between then and now. And it, it is just so good. It's so good to be back. Come on, look, look at the person next to you. Just say, so good to see you right now. Just so good to see you. Come on, this is fun. This is high school. I can say whatever I want now. There's no junior hires in here. <laughs> Who are my uh, brand new ninth graders? Anybody in the brand new ninth grade? Right here, come on. Come on, welcome our brand new ninth grade. Super pumped. Welcome. And uh, yeah, we, yes, we had services in June. You've been in ninth grade for a while, but we were over in the other building and we're officially here. And I'm so excited about this tonight and uh, the opportunity. I haven't preached since camp uh, and I, I'm excited to get into the word of God tonight. One of my favorite things to do is to study the word of God. One of my jobs is to, to be able to get into the word and to be able to share it with you in a way that hopefully helps you understand who God is and what he's done on our behalf. Amen. That's kind of the goal of this whole thing. And so you got a journal, give me a journal check. Throw it up there. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. If you don't want, if you don't have one, grab one in the lobby on the way out um, and uh, make sure you're doing that. And so uh, this, this evening, I want to talk about, uh, we're beginning a new series, uh, not a new series, a new old series called Show Your True Colors. Anybody been around for a Show Your True Colors before? Right? We've, we do this every year at this time. And uh, yeah, we did one earlier this year to kind of make up for COVID, but this is officially happening right now. This culminates in uh, like the second week of September with the color party. We'll be leaning up to that. And uh, so this is week one of Show Your True Colors, and we're calling this The Table, as if you couldn't tell already. And it's called The Table. And if you were here on Sunday, Pastor Reg talked about The Table. And I'm just kind of picking up where Pastor Reg left off with his incredible message um, from Sunday. And when he was talking about inviting someone to the dinner table, the first thing I thought of was when I invited the girl that I was dating to the family dinner table. Has anyone ever been there? You invited a boy or a girl to a dinner table? Anybody been there yet? Okay, good. You're not all dating. That's amazing. Thank you for not doing that yet. Um, but I, I, I just remember that moment because there's something about the table to where it's like, you can't get away. You're eating the meal, right? I don't know if my little brother is going to like fart while we're eating and then I'm like, oh my gosh. Or, or my older brother is going to tell that story that I know I don't want him to tell about the last girl that I was dating. And I'm like, come on, don't tell me that, right? And, but you're stuck at a table and you're having a conversation or, or, or even like my mom or my dad just saying something and I'm just like, oh my word, just like hiding right there. And uh, whereas in maybe at your age, I was embarrassed by my mom or dad. Uh, I am not embarrassed by my mom or dad anymore. They actually just drove in from Pennsylvania. They're in the back tonight and hanging out. Uh, and so uh, it just, I just remember like those moments. But that's what I do love about the other side of the dinner table is when like even at camp, like I loved mealtime. Because I got to sit down from across, across from some of you, and, and I got to hear about how your day was going, what's going on in your life. And there's just something amazing about the dinner table, right? You get to hang out, and you get to tell stories. You get to talk about what's going on in your life. You get to serve each other. You get to, here's the mashed potatoes, or here's the, the chicken, or, or here's the chicken nuggets. You get to see what people will or won't eat. You get, to, you, get to, uh, get, you get to be known, and you get to know each other. And there's just something special about the table. There's something special about sitting down and sharing a meal with somebody. And, uh, and I love that because Jesus knew how special the table was. He knew how special sitting at a table and sharing a meal with somebody was. So let's look at one of the times that Jesus shared a meal with somebody. Let's go to Matthew chapter 9. Uh, we're going to go 9 through 19 here. And uh, it starts off this way. It says, and Jesus passed on from there and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax, tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. That sounds like a good thing. And he rose and followed him, and Jesus reclined at the table in the house. Now, I'm going to pause there. We're going to finish this sentence in a minute, but there's so much drama happening right now. There's so much OBX drama by John B. right now and JJ happening in this episode of Jesus' life right now. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, they all die. I just want to let you know that that happens. Then 10 minutes later, they come awake, and they still find the gold. It's weird. Anyway, but uh, I, was, I, got, I got quarantined, and I watched the whole OBX. Anyway, there's so much drama happening in this. And if you could read this, and you could find the drama that's happening because Jesus lived 
2,000 years ago. We're talking about first century Judaism. We're talking 2,000 years ago, and there's so much drama happening here. And I want to show you the drama, because when you understand the drama, you'll understand how good God is in this moment. I want to show you who he is and what he has done. You may be like, I have zero clue why having dinner with a guy by the name of Matthew causes so much drama. Let's, let's finish this, right? So uh, there, he's reclined at the table in the house. So behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples at the table, right? And when the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, when they saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now you start to understand the drama of it all right now. They're like, why is Jesus sharing the table with a bunch of sinners, with a bunch of degenerates, with a bunch of dirty people? Why is Jesus sitting at the table with these type of people is basically what they're trying to say. And this is why this is wild, because you have Jesus, this rabbi, this teacher, doing all of these healings, teaching all of these amazing messages, pointing people to God. And, and, and at the same exact time, these people are like, what is happening? Why is Jesus breaking first century Jewish table purity customs? Maybe they're like, Jimmy, what is a first century Jewish table purity custom? <laughs> like, what does it even mean? We have table purity customs, right? Have any of you ever come in from like volleyball practice where my volleyball player is at? Anybody in here? Volleyball player, number seven all day, right? I'm just kidding. Anyway, sorry. I was number seven in soccer. But uh, volleyball players or football players coming in after two a days, or you're coming in after wrestling practice, or you know, coming in after praise youth because apparently the air conditioning is not on right now and I'm a million degrees and I'm going to have sweat coming out of my mullet pretty soon. And uh, you ever kind of come straight in? I mean, you're nasty, right? You haven't changed your socks yet. Uh, you know, you're just nasty, but there's food on the table. Has anyone ever tried to get past your mom and going straight to the dinner table without her being like, oh, go wash your hands right now. Like, you need to freshen up right now. You nasty. Don't come to the table until you're clean. Anybody ever have that happen to you before, right? It's the idea of like, you got to wash your hands. You're disgusting. Wash your hands before you eat. Now, there were all of these purity customs that the first century Jews had that took that to like the next level, like even beyond anything you could imagine. There were two goals of purity. One was kosher and one was uh, cleanliness. Kosher and cleanliness. Kosher is what? They had all of these rules in the Torah, which is basically Old Testament to us Americans reading the Bible. It's called the Torah. It's the Jewish literature of the Old Testament. They had all of these Jewish eating customs. And you can even find like kosher hot dogs today. The Jews, some observing Jews still eat like this to where there's no pork in it, no shellfish in it. It hasn't been like all sorts of like rules and regulations for what it means to eat clean food. And so one part of going to the Jewish dinner table had to do with what you were eating. And the other part had to do with how clean you were when you went to the table. Now, let me show you because like maybe you haven't, maybe you've read this before maybe or whatever. Luke chapter seven, Jesus is at a table. Um, he's actually at a party with some Pharisees, which are the religious people of the day. And so he's hanging out with them in Luke chapter seven and just kind of hear the different table purity customs in this historical moment. Luke seven forty four. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, Simon's the Pharisee, this woman is uh, a woman at the party. Do you see this woman? I entered your house and you forgot to wash my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I've come in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Just in that, just reading it historically, you can read it. There were three customs in that moment. It was washing someone's feet, anointing their head with oil, and kissing them. Now, I'm thankful that we don't do the kissing thing when people come over for dinner because that gets weird. I have an aunt, very Italian, kissed me on the lips one time, and I was like, okay, this is weird. But uh, do you have anybody have any family members that will give you a big old kiss on the lips? Anybody do that, right? Jordan's like, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, I'm not coming to your house for dinner, by the way. Um, it's just like customs of like, you know, they come in and, you know, they, most of them had the t didn't have closed-toed shoes like we have, and so they would wash their feet. They would anoint their head with oil. It would be a good smelling thing because you nasty and they didn't have Axe body spray at that time. And so they would kind of anoint their head with oil. This is just custom stuff that I think many of us understand. It's like, yeah, you would do that. You don't want to go to the dinner table nasty. 
You want to do these different things to make yourself clean. And this all makes sense because we share some of them as Americans. But what happened was in the Old Testament, these Pharisees loved to add rules on top of rules. They love to say, okay, the, the Torah says all of these cleanliness things about what to eat and how to come to the table. But even more than that, we are going to add on to those rules who can come to the table. They have to be of the same nation. They have to be in good standing citizen in your area. And they would basically created these table purity customs to a place that would say, you could tell how observant you were of the Torah based on your table custom. They would say, when you say observant of the Torah, how much you followed the word of God, AKA followed God himself. Could be a reflection of who and how you sat at the table. You can read things in the New Testament where they'd be like, John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking, and y'all called him a crazy man. Jesus came eating and drinking, and you called him a glutton and a drunkard. That's actually from Deuteronomy chapter 21 to where if somebody broke table purity customs, you could say, this person is a drunkard and a glutton. They're eating with the wrong type of people, and there would be a punishment associated with that. And so Jesus is here. Now, now that you know this, who you ate with, that wasn't really from the scriptures. It was more from the Pharisees adding on top of the scriptures. But it was like an idea of like, when you came to the table, you had to be clean when you would come to the table. When you would approach the Jewish first century table, you had to be clean to come to the table. And the people you were eating with had to be clean as well. And if they weren't clean, you were to send them away so that they could get clean to bring them back to the table. Now, that being said, my man Jesus is wild. Let, let's just go. Okay. We talked about how he ate with Matthew, who was a tax collector. That was in Matthew chapter 9. But we can also look at Luke chapter 7. Again, that story of Jesus reclining at the table, allowing this. Let's read this in its fullness. Uh, it says, uh, uh, then turning towards the woman. Who is the woman in the story? If you go look at Luke chapter 7, the woman in the story is a sinful woman from the city. And Jesus, at this party with all of these special people, allows this sinful woman to sit with him at the table. It's wild. They're like, wait, wait, wait. Aren't you breaking Jewish purity customs by allowing this woman to sit at your table? And then in Luke chapter 15 in verse 1, again, that was Luke 7. Let's go to Luke 15. Again, this is a historical document, so you're kind of reading it like a biography of the things that Jesus did. So a little bit later in Jesus' life, it says, Jesus threw a party for tax collectors and sinners, right? So now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners, and he eats with them. And then again, in Luke chapter 19, there's a parade that's held for Jesus. He's super popular by now. He's been healing people, and you can imagine, like, if healings were taking place and the sermons that he was preaching, he's incredibly popular at this time. There's a whole parade happening. Jesus comes through, and it's the story of Zacchaeus, if you heard it when you were a child. But the part of this story we want you to hear tonight, Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector, like the sinner of sinners. And it says, and when he came to the place, he looked up and he said to Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and he came and he received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone into to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. So all throughout Jesus' ministry, he's just like, I get your table purity customs, but I'm about to change everything. I'm about to change everything about what you are living and about what you are assuming about who is able to sit at the table with you. Because here's the beautiful thing about sitting at the table with somebody. Is have you ever been invited to sit with somebody? Have you ever, like, like, like have you ever been in a situation to where, like, I don't know who I'm going to sit with. I don't know who I'm going to be around. And you're like, I hope I don't sit alone. I hope that the table doesn't get full and I have to go sit by myself at another table. Has anyone ever been there before where someone invites you and says, hey, guess what? I will save you a seat. Is that not one of the most amazing things that ever happens? Like, no, no, no I got you. Like, I got your back, right? I got you. I got your back. I saved the seat. Someone tries to sit there. No, 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 no. This isn't for you, Pharisee. It's for my tax collector. Can you tell the Pharisee being like, you call yourself a rabbi? Aren't you supposed to be hanging out with other rabbis? And Jesus is like, no, no, no. I've already saved this seat for the sinner. And they're like, what are you doing, Jesus? 
Nobody does this. You know what people do? They try to get the most popular person to sit in the seat. They try to get the most influential people to sit in the seat. Because if you can share a table with somebody, you can create a bond with somebody. You create a bond with somebody, you can get residual fame and popularity and status from the person who's sitting at your table. And Jesus was not interested in any of that. He was interested in getting the sinner to sit at a table with him. And it's crazy if you begin to look at this stuff. Even though they had all of these weird purity customs that weren't in the Old Testament, that they had added to everything. And he was like, I am about to flip the script on everything. And it just gives me chills to think about it because I am a recipient of a table being held for me because while I was still in my sin, Jesus said, come, I've saved a seat for you. I'm calling you home to be a son, a daughter of the living God. I saved a seat for you at my table. I'm like, Jesus, I don't deserve to sit with you, Rabbi. Do you know what I've done? Do you know my sin? Do you know who I am? Do you know what I struggle with? Do you know my, my, my hurt? Do you know my hang-up? Do you know my problem? Do you know what I did this summer? And he's like, I know. And I saved you a seat anyway. Because this table is not trying for me to get something from you. It's me trying to give something to you. And here's what this sermon is all about tonight and what I want you to talk about in your small groups tonight. The old way of doing things is saying, you can sit with me if you are clean. And if you are clean, then you can sit with me. That's the old way of doing things. The old, you can eat with me if you are clean. So clean yourself up and then go and eat at the table. And Jesus is flipping everything, he's changing everything, and he is saying there's a new way of doing things. That's the old way of doing things. This is the new way of doing things. He's saying, you can eat with me and I will make you clean. You don't have to clean yourself up to sit at the table with Jesus. You come and just sit down with Jesus and he says, I will make you clean. You don't have to clean yourself up to go to Jesus. You go to Jesus to get clean. And this is why we talk about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that no matter what you've done, no matter what sin, no matter what you've done to hurt Jesus, God, your parents, your friends, your family, no matter what you've done, he saved a seat at the table and he says, come and I will make you clean. I will make you clean. But the problem is, is we live this out all the time. I ain't going to youth group tonight. I've messed up way too much this week. I'll clean myself up and then I'll go to youth group. I've messed up and I started to sin a little bit and I thought I broke that habit and I started to sin and so I'll clean myself up so that God will love me again. Rather than knowing that you don't clean yourself up to go to his table, you go to his table to get clean, amen? And it's such good news. Does that make sense tonight? Are you hearing me? Like, are, are you not just auditory listening, but you're hearing Shema right now? You're hearing and you're willing to walk this out and to understand that I go to the table to get clean. I don't have to clean myself up to go to God. I go to God and he is the one that cleans me up. Instead of requiring table purity at Jesus' table, he creates purity in you. And this is for anyone. Maybe you've lost your virginity already. You don't have to clean yourself up to go back to that table. Go back to the table and he creates purity in you. You are not too far gone. No matter what you've done, no matter who crowd you've gotten yourself into, there is always a seat at the table of Jesus Christ. And that is the good news. It's the good news for salvation, and it's the good news for sanctification. Sanctification, big word, process of growing and becoming like Jesus. Put that in your journal right now. Sanctification, big word, process of growing to become like Jesus. This message is good news for not only salvation, But it's good news for sanctification, for the process of knowing that when I mess up, don't try to prove yourself to God by getting clean. Go and be with your father and he will make you clean. And that's the table. That's the good news. And that's what I love about Jesus. And so the good news clearly is this. Romans 5 says, while we were still in our sin, at just the right time. That's Romans 1. I'm not there yet. But I'm saying Romans 5 says, while we were still in our sin, at just the right time. Is when God died for the sinner. It's when Jesus went to the cross. At just the right time. I love that language. That's technically Romans 3. I'm sorry. But at just the right time, Jesus died for sinners. 
And he said, I, I, I will make you clean. And it's good news. It's good news that I'm most proud to proclaim. And there's a reason why it's such good news is that tonight some of you thought that you've been too far from God. And tonight is your night to submit to Jesus. Call him Lord of your life. Come home as a son or daughter and sit at the table and receive your salvation. And for some of you, you've already received your salvation, but you've walked away from your sanctification, your process of becoming like Jesus. You've lost your holy habit from camp, your spiritual discipline from camp. But tonight, you are saying, I messed up, and I haven't even done any of my spiritual disciplines, but I will sit back down at the table because I'm not trying to prove to you by doing my disciplines. I'm doing my disciplines in response to you. So sit at the table tonight and say, God, help me become more like you. And I love this. This is why. This is such good news. It's news that I'm most proud to proclaim, which is show your true colors. This is where I'm getting to tonight, is that when I think about the table, when I think about Jesus eating with sinners, when I think about Jesus eating with people and allowing them to come to his table, I picture myself sitting in this seat and knowing that God has called me to his table even though I'm a sinner. And I can't imagine, I, it's hard for me to understand how good news this is. And after following him for 20 years, I'm still trying to figure it out how good my God is. Romans 1.16 says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone say everyone. To everyone who believes, there's a seat at the table. To everyone who believes, think about this, to the Jew first and then to the Greek, also to the Greek. This is a message that started in, Jew, in first century Judaism 2,000 years ago, and now it has spread across this planet for 2,000 years to where here we are in southeast Texas, 2021, talking about finding a seat at the table of Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but if Jesus is here, Inviting you to the table. Too many of you have grown up in the Bible Belt and you're acting more like the Pharisee than the sinner. You're acting more like the person over here being like, what is this? This isn't good news that anyone's able to come to this table. What about the person that bullied me last week? What about the person that took that thing from me? What about the person that took advantage of me at that party? What about the person that did that to me? What about the person that is hurting me? That person doesn't deserve a seat at the table. But the good news is that the seat is for everyone. That salvation is for everyone. And you get to understand and you get to see this. I love that Romans 1.16, that's in the ESV translation. The message translation is more of like a loose translation to kind of help you get the feel of it. It says, I love this. It's news I'm most proud to proclaim. It's news that I'm most proud to proclaim because I don't ever want to be the Christian over here with my arms closed. I want to be the sinner over here saying, I am in need of a savior every day of my life. Amen. And it's news that I'm most proud to proclaim, that I'm not better than anyone else. I just took a seat at the table and he's making me clean. It's an extraordinary message of God's powerful plan to rescue everyone who trusts in him, starting with the Jews and then right on to everyone else. It's such good news. Amen? There's a seat at his table. Galatians 3.23, Paul echoes this mindset. He says, in Jesus, there is neither Jew nor Greek. It doesn't matter your ethnicity, there's a seat at his table. It doesn't matter slave or free. It doesn't matter your economic status, rich or poor, there's a seat at his table. It doesn't matter uh, uh, whether it's you're a male or a female, there is a seat at his table. Because in Christ Jesus, we are all one. It's such good news. And so my question to you tonight is this. Have you experienced sitting at the table with Jesus. Have you? Have you experienced sitting at the table with Jesus? Because I know that there was a point in my life to where I was walking around broken and I experienced healing at the seat of Jesus. I know there was a point in my life where I walked around in addiction, but I experienced freedom sitting at the table with Jesus. I can testify to you tonight that I walked around thinking that I was a big deal and I experienced humility at the table of Jesus. I've been at that table with him many times, every morning, Every evening, in the afternoon, when I rise up, Shema, when I go to bed, Shema, I've been able to be at this table with Jesus, and I've experienced freedom, I've experienced humility, I've experienced going from death to life at this table with Jesus Christ. Have you? Talk about this in your small groups. Have you experienced sitting at the table with Jesus? And if you have, why wouldn't you invite everyone to come to the table? 
Why wouldn't you invite everyone? Why wouldn't you save a seat for everyone to come sit at the table? I want to finish with this last point because I want you to go to small groups and I want you to talk about this. So John 13, 35, write that in your notebooks. You always get mad at me for making you stand and then I say the best thing at the end. Write it down. John 13, 35, put your journals away and stand up. Come on. John 13, 35. Final story. This is at the end of Jesus' ministry. Again, I'm reading a, bio, a, a biography of Jesus' life. John takes 12 chapters to talk about all the things that happened. The first half of his book. Then he takes the second half of his biography. And it's all about the last week of Jesus' life. So here's this amazing moment where Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you. Do you want to know where Jesus is when he's giving you this, this moment? Do you know where Jesus is? He's at something called the Last Supper. Has anyone ever heard of that? Anybody know that, the Last Supper? What, what is a supper? I'm from the north, I know what a supper is, right? It's the last dinner. He's sitting at a table right here. He's sitting at the table and he looks around and he says, a new commandment I give to you, love one another just as I have loved you. And in that moment they're at the table, and they remember when Jesus called them to sit at the table. That when that Matthew in that moment is sitting there thinking, I was a tax collector sitting at a booth and now I'm sitting at the table with the living God. And so when he says, love one another as I have loved you, Matthew in that moment is thinking to love someone the way that God has loved me means to invite someone else to come sit at this table to experience healing in Jesus' name. And every disciple was able to hear that, love one another as I have loved you. And was able to apply that in a way of saying, somehow I'm sitting at this table and I've experienced his love and his healing and his righteousness and his goodness. And I wanna love people the way that God's loved me, amen? So that's my final challenge for you is we, uh, we have this conversation about what it means to show your true colors. If you've experienced sitting at the table with Jesus, you're supposed to be unashamed of the gospel and invite others to sit at the table with Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for who you are and what you've done in our lives. God, thank you that so many of us have been able to sit at the table with you and experience salvation. We were dead in our sin. and We are now alive because we were able to get to the table and you were to make us clean through your sacrifice on the cross for your victory over death and coming back to life and through your invitation to calling me home. I'm gonna pause right there. If, there. if you're in this room and you've experienced salvation at the seat at the table, you've experienced salvation before, would you raise a hand? Would you testify before the Lord in this prayer to say, I have received salvation through Jesus Christ. For every hand that's raised, I challenge you to love your friends Keep your hand up. To love your friends, to love your family, to love your team, to love the people that you come in contact with the same way that God's loved you and invite them to sit at the table with Jesus. Put your hands down. And maybe there's somebody in this room who's never surrendered to Jesus, never given their whole life to Jesus in salvation. You've never sat down and said, God, I am dead in my sin. I need a savior. I'll sit at the table if you make me clean. If you're gonna give me your righteousness, your standing as a son before God, I'm in. And I've never done that before, but tonight is my night, knowing that I don't have to clean myself up to go to you. I want to be clean, I want to experience salvation, and I want to go to you. Is there anyone here tonight that wants to receive salvation in Jesus Christ? Is there anybody here? Raise a hand. You mean that? Yeah, that's awesome, man. I've been there before. I sat at that table, changed my life. Incredible, thank you. Yeah, one, one hand, anybody else want to join this young man in salvation tonight, following Jesus? That's incredible. Come on, y'all, one young man just decided to follow Jesus tonight. That's incredible. Welcome to the family, bro. It's incredible. So God, be glorified. One last time, God, be glorified in everything that we say and do. God, as we worship you in these next few moments, God, would our minds be filled of the moments you've loved us and as we sat at your table. God, give us wisdom and knowledge to understand who you are and what you've done. And God, would we respond and give you the glory that is due your name in these next few moments of worship. Come on, if you love Jesus, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Let's worship.